is deviating, but I'll tell you. I, I have a lot of different, uh, you know, I think about my, I've never had a net air, but let's just say I've had some very close things in my years. But one of them was, I was in an A7, I was chasing a B1 at adverse, I was at 20,000 feet, I was going to rest in probably about 200 feet away from home, and had a glider fly exactly the same altitude. I was not looking for a glider. There was no grid, no <coughs> word about gliders being up above 18,000 feet or anything. It was right between us. It was a B1 that probably had two hours on it. And it was like... <laughs> so, okay. Uh, here's, uh, I just got this from uh, this glider accident report from 2014. Starts off saying most accidents can be prevented by simple common knowledge and simple easy changes to flying procedures. We just talked about all kinds of things. All these things are little simple things, but you, but you do seven little simple mistakes in the right sequence and you end up with serious bad Okay, so more people were killed, uh, the, some of this you won't like to hear. But more people were killed by mules than in aircraft. Uh, let's see, magazine, uh, Glider Making International Magazine said there were 461 glider fatalities. Um, I said we right here, and that was in 20, that was all over the world. Um, I think there were, uh, here there's uh, gliders, uh, uh, just kind of run through this up a little Okay, here's a 10 year fatal accident. Here's the 10 uh, year fatal accident uh, reports. First one, hit mountain. We've been talking about that, right? And you kind of go, oh, that's some dumbass is someplace else. You know one of those guys from the club who was right up on the side of that mountain, right? right between you two, two players, got rock, got, got off with helicopter. He's alive, so I'm fine. But, but uh, the Frank's the one that knows me a little bit Uh Premature terminations of the toe. That's what we practice, nine of them. We practice that all the time. Premature terminations of the toe. Medical. We're going to talk about that too. Now, another thing with medical, another thing about gliders, we don't need medical certificates, right? And uh, which I think is kind of weird, but uh, you got to be thinking about medical, your medical condition up here. You have your own ready to do all this stuff. Uh, landing stall or stall and spins, improper assembly, that's bad. <laughs> but that's one reason why we do that positive control check. I talked to you about that maybe. Okay, Really too much here, but it's, a, it's something that you have to get in the gliders because unlike fixed wing uh, airplanes, well, if you ever take a flight control off, uh, you do anything with flight controls in a, in a fighter, uh, there's everybody that has to get in the front of to sign off on those things in the back of We do it right here. So this is the, the youngest people here. So that's why we go out and do a positive control check, applying pressure to the thing, make sure that they're really connected. Uh, landing, hit ground, low altitude turn. We'll talk about that at the end of the coming up at Dragon Wing. Uh, landed short. Turns out uh, I, I talked to the Soaring uh, Safety Foundation president a year ago. Had to do with our flying high speed here, coming back around. And he, and that's what they do in, uh, in, um, um, in competitions, at the end of competitions. But they, they're starting to get away from it. The guys don't, there are some exceptions Frank can tell you about. The guys don't normally run into the ground though on high speed. That's not what it is. They run into the ground with no speed. Because they run on by high speed and run themselves out of energy and then come on and operate with the And that's that's what happens with those, not the not the high speed portion. With like I said, some exceptions. <laughs> Frank can discuss that some other day, right, Frank? Yeah. <laughs> um, Hit trees on final approach. No problem. We don't have any damn trees around here. But uh, the, obviously, uh, too low. Uh, if I, if you know how I fly, I have a glide slope. I stay slightly below the glide slope until I'm down there. Um, I can get rid of energy. I don't have an engine to make it back. Uh, mid air collision, we talked about shoulder <coughs> off. Off field landing, only one died off field landing. It's kind of uh, oxygen starvation, one, rope break one, in the piles one. Uh, so uh, uh, there's the reasons for um, 
here's some interesting stuff. It says, pilots, who are you? Get ready to pat yourself in the back because you're intelligent, you're well to do, you're well educated. Alcohol plays no role. It's kind of interesting because, you know, we have beer here and everything. We do not want to clean up on this. And it's, just, it's just something to do it. Um, uh, these guys used to have a beer for lunch, right? In their squadrons. In Germany? Breakfast? Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so, ultra, <laughs> but. <laughs> we didn't fly with alcohol. It just, uh, it's just like, it's just like, you just don't do it. It's not part of it. It's totally against the culture. Uh, leadership types. How to explain our extraordinary high accident rate? Comparing aviation to highway deaths. Uh, this is a couple years also. The US population then was 309 million. There are 33,000 highway deaths, so that's one in 9,000. Uh, glider pilot population is about 11,000 in the United States. There are eight fatalities, so one in 1,400 uh, versus one in 9,400. So if there were 309 million glider pilots, there would be over a million deaths. So, so, uh, uh, and but but I'll tell you what, I don't, I do not think uh, flying is uh, inherently dangerous. It's a it's a higher risk uh, uh, task. And uh, therefore, you have to manage the risk. And you manage the risk by through training, through discussions, through uh, through things like this. We talk to each other. We you don't come back here if you screw something up. You don't hide it. You come back here and you talk to people about it because you teach them as well as yourself how to avoid those things. I could just say a lot of people have died to keep you alive, and I, that's why I do. So I talked about one of them. Uh, one of those accidents uh, was uh, a year ago. Uh, it was a classmate of mine. His name was Bob Knock. He, I probably, if I've told you stories about uh, Jackie Parker and some stuff, but he was a uh, he was a two-star general uh, in charge of Syracuse, uh, or in charge of the New York Guard. Uh, he spent 33 years in the Air Force in the Guard, and uh, ended up with 37 uh, hours of fighter time, uh, which is enormous amount of fighter time. But I got to and, uh, and so he was extremely experienced by uh, He was out uh, last year in uh, Arizona, uh, uh, had a rope break or so, or just came disconnected at 100 feet, and 100 feet, he turned around and ran into a hole and got killed. Okay, so uh, you probably heard me say that I could go out there 100 feet, I'd take off, pull the rope, turn around, and land. And I can't, no doubt about it. There's a really important difference. Why I say that is that because I'm doing it enough and I'm preparing for it, and it's part of my process. Of what really happens on rope breaks and we think, we all think that we see things that fast, and then our reaction time is that fast, and we do our thing right now. That's what I'm uh, it takes us a while. It takes us what what you normally plan into all the stuff is two seconds. And but what it feels like, whenever when anything goes, and if you've ever talked to somebody who injected, um, uh, the, the story goes like this. You know, the plane was falling apart, I reached out, grabbed the handles, and punched. And nothing happened. I was going, oh, shit. And then, okay, I'm going to have to do a manual bailout. And they're still hanging up, and they start going through, okay, how do I do that? i got to get rid of the canopy, and they go through the next two procedures that they do, and then all of a sudden they notice a glow. And they look on down, there's a glow, and all of a sudden all the smoke comes out. And then the campy's gone, there, and, they, and they punch out of the airplane. Okay, they have a whole long story about all those events that occur. How long did it take between the time they pulled the handle and that glow occurred? 0.2 seconds. They felt like it was minutes, because they're just so pumped up, and. And so your reaction is, oh, God, I had a rope break and I didn't even recognize it for so long. I should have, man, what an idiot. I really got to do a high jump maneuver now to save my ass. No. What you are is that you're a typical human being, and it took you about two seconds before you were doing this thing. That's built in there. That's why we say 200 feet. Because we are dealing with human beings. Now, we have some cocky. Uh, arrogant <laughs> human beings in here because we're the fighter pilot types, right? And uh, so we all think that we that no, that's not us. We as the stuff. Nope. We are. Everyone's got the same stuff. So 
Um, what he did at 100 feet was he succumbed to uh, confidence in the area that he shouldn't have been. It's 200 feet. We talk about it. You got to you live or die by these things. You, you have to know uh, what uh, so Like I said before, a lot of people have died to teach us these things. Believe them. Live by by following. So uh, sad. Uh, uh, and uh, here's a guy that was as, as experienced as you can get. And he made a simple error. A couple of years in a competition, my guess is that he probably, if you turn this stuff, there's all this planning on the all the stuff, and he's first off, and he's probably just running along like a wild man. He probably had all those little simple things that went on, and then the last one got. So don't let that happen. So that's my first bit. Uh, any other comments? And we're going to wrap it up right now. Let's talk about Rob, why don't you get up here and talk about it? Okay. Uh, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, to, this is primarily to the tow pilots, but uh, some of this stuff uh, uh, I think you can take into account if you're a uh, provider pilot as well. Uh, I sent a, uh, an email out on the, uh, on the uh, website talking about uh, pitot heat on the tow plane. The tow plane has got, unfortunately, has two circuit breakers on it that are used as switches. One of the circuit breakers uh, up on the uh, up on the top, here's the, here's the panel, where there's two circuit breakers. The circuit breaker that's up on the top is for the, uh, is for the rotating beacon. That circuit breaker needs to be in rotating beacon on. There's a circuit breaker just below that, which is pitot heat. That circuit breaker needs to be out, unless you need pitot heat. I can't uh, imagine why you'd be flying in the clouds below freezing. But, uh, anyway, the normal position for that circuit breaker is going to be out. Okay? And I've, I've gotten in the airplane a couple of times here recently. One other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, towing the gliders, uh, towing gliders to the mountains. The, the thing is, is that uh, we have different gliders here. Different gliders have different uh, amounts of performance. The Blonic is what a 25 to one of the kind of 28, 28 to one. You know, the uh, Mike Golf Groves, of course, are much better than that. But if, if you think about that. 28 to 1 means that for, uh, you know, uh, we need 28,000 feet to descend 1,000 feet. And 28,000 feet is, uh, what, just about over four nautical miles. So the, the mountains are actually maybe just a little bit farther than that. My point is, is that if you as a tow pilot are going to take to the mountains, you need to make sure that if the rope breaks at any particular point, 